everybody, and welcome to the first of IOTSF's monthly webinars for 2024. Since we last saw each other, we presented the IoT Security Champion Award at the annual TechWorks dinner in Manchester, England this past December. The winner was Device Authority. Commiserations to the other nominees who were Codacip and the IASME Corporation. Our first guest today is, in fact, from the sponsor of that very award, Keysight Technology. He is VP of Security Solutions, and in his presentation, he'll discuss the importance of full-spectrum security testing of IoT devices and the certification schemes that governments around the world are promoting to elevate security. We'll also be joined by Michael Richardson today, who is in Ottawa, so it's very much a North American broadcast today in terms of our guests, but the first of which is Scott Register, and he is in Austin, Texas. Scott, the floor right. is yours. All right, thank you very much. Let's uh, make sure everything's working here. You're, you're seeing the screen. Uh, so again, thanks for uh, thanks certainly for having me uh, today, uh, bright and early as it is here in, in Austin. Uh, again, I'm Scott Register, VP of Security Solutions here at uh, Keysight. Um, background is basically network security, which I've been doing for 30 odd uh, years, you know, uh, uh, maybe a, a decade more than, than uh, I'd like to admit. Um, started out kind of doing network security, firewalls, um, VPNs, things like that. Uh, and have moved on to focus on uh, IoT security which turns out to be really, really interesting. Um, been gotten to uh, be involved in some interesting sort of national initiatives uh, here in the States, which is uh, pretty fascinating. And uh, and I will get into that. And, you know, it's not really hyperbolic to think that, you know, testing these devices is actually pretty important. Certainly if you're thinking about, you know, critical infrastructure, medical uh, devices, things like that. So uh, thanks for joining me today. Um, it will probably be um, difficult kind of to answer questions real time as we go, but uh, uh, questions in the chat window and certainly at the end of the presentation, I will try to, um, you know, I will try to get to those and these slides will be distributed um, afterwards. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks for that. So a little bit of background on Keysight, and I certainly acknowledge, you know, where if you're not sort of in uh, particular spaces, we, we may not be a household name, but Keysight is actually the original like Hewlett Packard. So the original test and measurement core of Hewlett Packard is now Keysight. So we're the largest test and measurement vendor in the world, um, roughly 16,000 employees around the globe. Um, and, about, I don't know, five and a half ish billion revenue, something like that. So pretty large. Um, we're used primarily by different types of um, manufacturers, service providers, government agencies, et cetera, for testing anything from, you know, uh, embedded like pacemakers, if you want to do battery drain analysis, electric vehicles, if you want to do radar testing for like a new fighter jet, you want to simulate incoming missiles. All that kind of stuff, network testing, you know, we, we sort of, um, you know, we, we do it all. We, we've done uh, a lot on the 5G side. So everything from um, RF testing to signaling, you know, we're very involved uh, in both the testing and uh, a lot of the, uh, the working groups, right? The ORAN Alliance Working Group 11 and, and the Consumer Technology Association, 5G forums, et cetera, you uh, kind of, you name it. Okay. Um, and... I won't spend a lot of time on it now, but I mentioned we are, you know, and I've gotten to be involved in some national initiatives uh, around security, especially uh, things like the Cyber Trust Mark uh, in the U.S., which is a, a new uh, program for consumer IoT devices that I will get into. Okay, now, a uh, brief um, sort of note on scoping of this, uh, of this conversation. If you think about what the sort of IoT ecosystem looks like or what like a, an IoT rollout is, and this could be in any field, could be medical devices, could be connected cars, et cetera. Um, 
there are the individual devices, you know, whether it's your smartwatch or a webcam or a door lock or a cardiac monitor or whatever, there's typically some kind of app in, in kind of modern world is often uh, a mobile app. doesn't uh, have to be that, that, you know, gives you a UI and lets you uh, control things. And then that's connected across some kind of internet. Uh, it could be a mobile network, et cetera, but through some ISP across the internet. And then there's a, a cloud backend. Now, we could spend, we could actually spend hours on each stage of this. You could, you know, you can certainly spend a lot of, of time uh, on things like mobile application security testing and interaction of, of apps with different mobile operating systems. There's, um, we're very involved in uh, like the ORAN Alliance uh, working group 11 security testing uh, for like ORAN deployments. Um, you can spend certainly days thinking about um, cloud application security and uh, um, application or uh, cloud security posture assessment, things like that. But for purposes of this discussion, I'm really going to think about uh, and, and talk about the testing the devices themselves, because that's in a lot of ways the least uh, sort of understood, I think, part of the puzzle. Like, you know, we're not, we aren't always great at cloud security, but we've certainly, we're, we're certainly sort of far enough into it that we've started to understand like best practices and who owns what, you know, what does the cloud provider own? What does the, the user, the app developer own? What, what's everyone uh, responsible for securing? I think that's a lot less clear on the, the IoT side. And so that's where we're, uh, we're going to focus today. Um, and so a, a big question here is like, so, why do we even think about testing these devices, right? There is um, sort of a tendency, I think, to think about IoT devices sort of the way that, that we think about our phones, right? Um, that someone else is taking care of the security, right? Uh, and that is often um, not the case. Uh, and, you know, with... A lot of IoT devices, I don't know, think about the thermostat on the wall uh, in my house, you know, smart thermostat, and it's got remote sensors, you can control it from the cloud, you can do remote, you know, all this stuff, and it's got motion detection and presence detection. You know, that that little device has more compute power than the space shuttle had, right? When, when we sent it into um, orbit, and, you know, it's got all these exposed network interfaces, it's got Bluetooth, it's got Wi-Fi and all of that. Um, and so, you know, that, that exposes uh, a lot of kind of capability for that device to do bad things, right? And, and those are increasingly becoming um, kind of targets for attackers. And there's plenty of sort of statistics that highlight the increase in, you know, threat actors specifically targeting IoT uh, devices. Um, and, you know, and certainly as I've gotten into kind of IoT security testing, we see plenty of evidence of this, right? Pr uh, sort of gaping holes in, in IoT security. And so when you think about the people who are deploying devices, whether it's you know, thermostats, badge scanners, whatever, uh, in the environment, they often lack the... And this is not like, this isn't a, a judgment, but they also often lack kind of the, the sort of domain specific knowledge or even tools to kind of grapple with the particular security challenges that those IoT devices pose on their, uh, on their networks. Now, why is that? Well, we've developed a really good set of sort of, again, best practices in the traditional IT world. Are we perfect at it? No, right? People get breached every day. But the reality is, and if, if anybody out there is in the you know, kind of security world, uh, it'd be interesting to, it, it would be interesting to see if anyone disagrees with this. If you do sort of the basics of hygiene, you keep your operating system up to date, whether it's on your you know, Windows laptops, your servers, whatever, and you install some kind of decent EDR, you know, endpoint security software, you know, pick your, your vendor, those two things together will solve probably 95% of your security problems, right? Because most attacks against sort of traditional IT devices, your 
you know, uh, your Linux servers, your Windows laptops, et cetera, they aren't new. Like they're not zero days, right? Hackers aren't, you know, churning those out every day and, and novel attacks. Most of the time, attacks are really just leveraging kind of holes that have been around for a long time and no one has bothered to patch or oh, I rolled out something and I, I did a version rollback. And so now I've got an old, uh, an old OS, whatever, and that leaves some hole or I forgot to turn off SMB v1 God forbid, and something like that, right? And so that's very well understood. And if you follow sort of basic best practices, um, you're probably pretty safe from, from most, you know, the attacks that are out there, which, which are sort of opportunistic. On the authentication side, um, I think we all know the challenges of things like weak passwords and, you know, uh, you know, not having mixed case and special characters and, and having guessable passwords, et cetera. But if you use multi-factor authentication, um, again, that now, and there are, you know, spoofing attacks and things like that. But if you use, if you've deployed MFA, you are again, um, protected from the vast majority of kind of authentication based attacks, brute force attacks and things like that. Cause the person, the attacker doesn't have the, the multi-factor. Great, right? So we've, you know, our kind of IT people, you know, have the tools to to deal with most of the challenges they're going to see on the traditional IT side. Now, let's think about IoT, right? And I'm thinking about this. I mean, it could be in your home, you know, your smart light switches, thermostats, things like that, or certainly in like an enterprise setting or a healthcare uh, environment where, okay, I've deployed all these little connected devices great and they're doing you know good things for me on my network what operating system are they running i probably have no idea right what versions of what libraries do they have Meh, you got me right and even if i knew let's say oh i've got this you know badge scanner i've got you know what i've got a printer whatever on my network um even if I know what operating system is, it is, and even if I know that it's out of date, what am I going to do about that, right? Because I can't just arbitrarily push an operating system update to a printer or scanner, a batch scanner, you know, whatever it is. I'm sort of uh, at the mercy of the vendor to provide those updates for me, right? So I have to wait on them. Now, are they going to tell me what's in an update? Not necessarily. Do they tell me what versions of what libraries they're using? And, oh, I'm using an obsolete TLS or I'm uh, susceptible to log for shell attacks, whatever, they're probably not going to tell me that, right? And so you're, we, we often find ourselves in the situation where we're deploying all these connected devices without really understanding how those devices are expanding our attack surface. So we're going sort of full steam ahead, but we're doing it without the knowledge of, of, the, of not just how to secure those devices, but how they're putting us uh, more at risk. Obviously, we typically don't have endpoint security. Uh, on those devices, right? They are resource constrained and they're just, you know, nobody sells antivirus software for printers, right? Or if they do, please correct me because because uh, I haven't uh, I haven't seen that. Another thing that, that um, and I'll, I'll cover this in a little more uh, detail, I'll actually show a, a demo of this. IoT manufacturers um, have fairly complex supply chains and they, if they're not doing a lot of security testing, it's very easy to inherit a component, a you know Bluetooth system on chip, something like that, that has embedded security holes that the IoT manufacturer is not even aware of. They put it into their IoT device and pass it downstream to their customers. And now those customers are exposed to security gaps that the IoT manufacturer isn't even aware of and probably can't uh, can't fix can't fix directly because they're dependent on someone else. And I'll I'll get into some some specific um, like I said, I'll I'll go through a demo of, of what that looks like in uh, in practice. Now there are plenty of examples. You know I showed some statistics earlier about the the rate of increase in vulnerabilities found on IoT devices, uh, etc. This is the case across. You know, basically every vertical, right? Where you're talking about industrial controllers, uh, smart home devices like door locks, printer. Now, printers, I've always thought, are a really interesting kind of special case because what gets printed in an office now is typically either 
the most important or least important stuff. It's either like the flyer for the, you know, pizza lunch on Friday, or it's, you know, it's offer letters or it's important documents, it's financial stuff, right? If, and, and most printers now are, thing, are obviously they're network connected because you can send print shops over the network. A lot of them can do things like scan and send emails of, you know, if I want to scan something, I scan and it gets emailed to my inbox or it, it can be, you know, sent to someone else. That's great. But that means that that device is already capable of kind of sending messages over the internet in, in different formats, right? So, and again, computational power is pretty high. So if you can plant a piece of malware, on a printer and just say, hey, any print job that comes from the CFO or the head of engineering or whatever, send me a copy of that. That's a pretty good way to sneak data out of a network. And it would be very, very hard to uh, detect. Webcams. Now, there have been, I mean, if you follow, uh, the, the, these are fairly widely uh, publicized. There's lots of examples of um, things like baby monitors and webcams being uh, being able to be hijacked uh, and, you know, kind of redirecting audio and, and video feeds. Now, sometimes uh, it's just because of things like static passwords. People unpack their little, you know, they, again, their baby monitor, their whatever, and they set it up on the network and they never change the password. And there's, uh, there's actually like webcam roulette, like websites that you can go to and just, you know, they're trolling the internet, looking for uh, things listening on a certain port, and they know the static, you know, the the default password. You log in, redirect the video stream, so you can kind of you know listen on on everything. Sometimes it's a little more complex than just a static password, but um, you know you can push commands and, and redirect direct, uh, devices to do things. Um, being with pl plenty of examples of, of these devices being vulnerable medical devices. Um, uh, it's interesting. We actually found, uh, or the, you know, the the software that my company makes was actually used to find a class of uh, Bluetooth low energy attacks that the FDA, which is the medical device regulatory agency in the states, actually put out an urgent uh, safety communication around because medical device manufacturers who incorporated. Um, chipsets from like you know, 10 different um, vendors were susceptible to, you know, crash, reboot, or even escalation of privilege attacks, which is a pretty bad thing if you're thinking about medical devices, right? Um, another reason that, that this is a big deal, um, medical environments like uh, hospitals, right, are uh, the number two target for ransomware attacks behind uh, financials because they typically are and the short staffed and the services that they're providing are critical. And as medical devices become, again, increasingly uh, connected and powerful, those, uh, those devices make really nice targets for you know, threat actors because, okay, maybe you can't lock down all the workstations on a hospital network, but if you can do things like disable all the cardiac monitoring stations that are you know, on, the, on the little carts by everyone's bed, you can disable the hospital. You can hold it for uh, for ransom, right? So we see lots of uh, of uh, examples of this. Okay, so whether you're building or deploying IoT devices, you want to think about testing, right? Testing those devices so that you have either if you're deploying some understanding of how your attack surface is going to expand when you roll these devices out and give you some sort of leverage to go to contact the manufacturer and say, hey, I know you've got this problem. Or if you're building those devices, um, how should you think about testing? What types of testing should you do to make sure that your devices aren't putting your eventual consumers uh, at, at risk? And, you know, I, I sort of, I don't know, this is like an industry standard thing. This doesn't, you know, exactly map to like OWASP uh, IoT uh, top 10, but I sort of think out of it this way and how this maps to like the OS model. Vulnerability assessment, I think everyone is pretty familiar with, and you know, this isn't gonna be exact, but that's often revealing problems at kind of application layer. Oh, your web stack is vulnerable to a SQL injection attack and you're exposing web API on your IoT uh, device uh, for configuration uh, and, and, and management. Brute force attacks, again, this is, uh, you know, an oldie but a goodie, but if there's some authentication to connect to the device for configuration management, 
is, do you have a guessable uh, password? Um, encryption, right? Uh, now, encryption can present a special challenge on IT devices because a lot of them are low power, right? There's a lot of battery powered devices out there and they're meant to be deployed for a long time, maybe without changing or, or recharging the battery, which limits their ability to do things like strong encryption, right? And so, you know, we often see devices with maybe suboptimal encryption, encryption, whether it's at the application level or even, you know, things like uh, Wi-Fi uh, encryption. And the manufacturer is basically making a trade-off of, um, you know, uh, for, of security for, for power drain, right? But if you're sending critical information or if uh, session hijack is a big deal, that's certainly something that, that you want to look for. Protocol fuzzing is probably, um, uh, you know, it, it, when I do kind of presentations like this, the, the audience typically falls into two groups, those who are familiar with protocol fuzzing and have done it a lot, and those who look at it and go, yeah, I'm not really sure what that is. So just briefly, protocol, there, I'll, I'll get into a little more uh, detail, but basically you're trying to screw up a, the protocol stack uh, on the other side. Now, firmware analysis, um, so all, all the things I'm talking about here uh, are really things that you can do across the network, right? I've got a connected device and I can do brute force passwords attacks. I can make sure the device is only using valid certs and using strong encryption. I can attack the Bluetooth stack or the Wi-Fi stack. Uh, those are all you know, kind of external black box testing. Firmware analysis, that's somewhere where you actually have to have like the firmware and you can look at it from the inside, right? So again, I think everyone's probably familiar with the concept of vulnerability uh, assessment. Same principle uh, for for IT devices and you know your your laptops, your application servers, et cetera. And again, as kind of IoT devices become more powerful and expose more inter interfaces, then traditional vulnerability assessment starts to apply more and more to these devices. Right? You scan the device, and you know, especially if it's like Android based or something, it's going to start to look a lot like any other Linux device. And so the traditional vulnerability assessment uh, makes a lot of sense. Now, protocol fuzzing, this is something that, that certainly I've, I've had a lot of, uh, kind of a lot of fun with because we found some pretty interesting um, crashes. So this is where you're intentionally injecting errors into some kind of protocol stream to try to trigger a crash, a hang, a reboot, something at the other end of the connection. Now, certainly you can do this, you can do this at, you know, sort of layer two through seven. You can certainly think about application layer protocol fuzzing, you know, um, can you send malformed fields and, and web commands, right? You know, something is too long or too short or invalid or doesn't make sense. But where in sort of, you know, my experience here at Keysight, where we found this to be really, really valuable is doing link layer attacks against things like Wi-Fi stacks, Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth low energy. Um, so I'll, I'll show a, a, a cool demo of like a particular flaw that, that we found. But what you're doing is, you know, things like sending messages out of order, or you're doing message replay, or you're sending packets that uh, either are too long or too short or have fields that are too long or too short, right? The link field in the header says you're going to be sending 32 bytes of data, but you only send 34 bytes. Um, if you think about, like on the TCP side, if you think about sending a TCP packet with a sin and fin bit step, that's not something that, you know, the receiving stack may be expecting. And you might be able to trigger some kind of bad behavior uh, on that side. And especially if you can do this with a low level protocol stack, you might be able to take the device out entirely by crashing the stack, right? Uh, and, and certainly we've uh, we've seen this. Now, firmware analysis, I mean, certainly if you've dealt with things like um, S-bombs, right? You know, software uh, bill of materials, a lot of times you're going to generate that through by doing um, firmware analysis, right? Or software analysis uh, and, and, and typically doing it uh, statically. And you can do, you know, the, the real benefit there, or it's sort of benefit number one, is you can understand what libraries a piece of software is using. 
um, because we all know that something like what 90% of, of, of software is just open source, right? And so we take all these open source libraries and kind of stitch them together with a little glue of your own. And then you, you put your product, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the market, right? So allowing you to correlate the libraries that are in use with known CVEs lets you see without having to actually do like testing or, or demonstrate a, a vulnerability. Oh, I know you've got a vulnerability in this software because you're using this library and it's old and maybe I haven't figured out exactly how to exploit it, but I know that the vulnerability is there. And so you need to, uh, to do this. You can also find things like embedded static passwords, right? If you're, if you're looking at firmware and find, you know, other types of uh, programming flaws. Now, when you're doing software analysis, um, two kind of big buckets that, um, that I really think about here, um, static and dynamic analysis, right? So static analysis is where you're looking at, you know, code sort of in the isolation. And you can look at source code, you can look at firmware, typically on the IoT side, where you're gonna end up doing is, is looking at firmware because you either download it from the manufacturer website, or if you're really lucky, maybe you've got access to something like a JTAG interface on the device and you can extract the firmware. Can't always count uh, on that, but if you can, that, that's, uh, that's great. Um, the advantage of doing the static analysis is basically you can do it sort of anywhere, right? Um, you don't have to look at that firmware on the device, you just have access to it. So you can you know, do it in the cloud, do it on a server, whatever, you don't need a particular um, architecture. And as I mentioned, one of the big benefits here is you can generate that SBOM just by looking at the firmware and understanding what libraries are in use and correlating that with kind of known CVEs. You don't have to discover anything. It's basically a, you know, a, a, a database look at, right? Um, and that's actually for, when I say it's easy to do, certainly for um, things that are OS based, like if you're looking at the firmware from something like an Android based device, which it could be, you know, an auto head unit or a Peloton bike or whatever uh, it is, there are kind of lots of good tools available for doing that. It gets a little harder if you're talking about sort of operating system less devices, you know, bare metal um, devices. And certainly in the IoT world, there are those things out there and just because they're smaller and they're lower power and, and you know, have less memory and things like that. So you're not running a whole OS, you're running the kind of IoT application on bare metal. That can be a little trickier because you have to have an analysis engine that understands that architecture. So it's not possible, but it might be a little more uh, challenging. Now, dynamic analysis means you're looking at software as it uh, executes, right? Um, now, there are a couple of different ways to do this. Um, if you're doing dynamic analysis on just an app that's running on a laptop or a server or something, that can really be pretty straightforward because typically if you're doing this, it requires either um, an instrumented operating system, you know, this reporting on, oh, what OS calls are being made and how many bytes of data were sent into this. And you can look at like data that's going into the network stack before and after an encryption and things like that. Um, or you, uh, if you don't have that option, then it may require the application developer to actually develop the, the app, the IoT app, against an instrumented SDK, right? So that when you make like a system call or something, if the operating system isn't reporting on that natively, you've, in, you've um, used a particular SDK, you know, to as kind of a shim layer on top of those APIs. And that API uh, engine or that SDK can report data out. Now that could be really difficult if you're doing it on um, an actual IoT device, again, the resource constrained, um, it may not have the power to do that, may not have the appropriate network interfaces, things like that. So if you're gonna do dynamic analysis, you, that may mean you end up doing it in an emulator environment, which is great, that's fine. I mean, there's not absolutely a bad thing. The one thing you might be missing though is the actual like hardware, right? If like you may make assumptions about the underlying Wi-Fi chipset or Bluetooth chipset or something, which behave normally on your emulator, but actually in the wild on the chipset as deployed, there may be um, other vulnerabilities that you just can't find on uh, an emulator. There are some nice um, things that you can do with dynamic analysis though. If you're doing something like, let's say you're testing some kind of injection attack against an API, 
it may take a long time to act to let's say trigger a crash if you're doing that but if you have dynamic analysis so you're looking at code uh you know executing code in runtime you can see oh yeah whatever i'm doing you know as i'm passing these commands it is triggering a memory leak so if i do it enough or i send a certain amount of data yeah i know the device is going to crash uh so it can certainly accelerate uh things like that you can also and this is actually when you think about things like IoT certification, one of the real uh, advantages of the dynamic runtime testing is you can do things like validate, hey, when I'm saving credentials to memory, you know, or other sensitive data, is that storage encrypted, right? Because if you're on the platform, if you're on the OS, that's something you can verify. Okay, so what does this look like in uh, practice? So here I'm gonna show a demo. This is actually, you know, this is using uh, our software, like the Keysight's IoT testing software, but there's not necessarily anything magical um, about it, right? I mean, in principle, you can find this, uh, in this case, with any good, like, Bluetooth fuzzing engine. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a new scenario uh, that's doing protocol fuzzing as opposed to uh, vulnerability assessment, and we talked about those. And my target here is going to be Oh, yeah, it's back there on the shelf. This is actually a pretty big brand name um, video doorbell, right? So it's a doorbell, you push the button, rings, and it's got a, a camera built in. Now, I don't know anything advanced uh, in advance about this other than the manufacturer of the system on chip, uh, which in this case is Texas Instruments. So I can scan just for whatever's in radio range. I know how they name their devices. I can find that. Now, what makes this interesting is that this video doorbell maker, um, like many, uses a system on chip you know, that they didn't make that controls both the Bluetooth uh, and the Wi-Fi stack. Pause for a second. So what does that mean? That means you've got Bluetooth implementation, uh, in this case, Bluetooth Low Energy, and Wi-Fi implementation. They're on the same chipset. They're using shared memory, things like that. Now, why do you have both of these stacks. A lot of these IoT devices have things like Bluetooth for ease of setup, right? I plug the device in, I turn, you know, it's got Bluetooth turned on. I can bring up a little app on my phone that says, oh, I've discovered a new light switch or doorbell or webcam or whatever it is. Uh, and you do the initial connection from your phone and that will do things like pass. Oh, here's the SSID and other configuration info. And then it joins the Wi-Fi network um, and things like uh, the video stream are actually passed over the Wi-Fi, right? Okay, so what I've done uh, here, uh, pause for a second, is I've started a Bluetooth low energy protocol fuzzing attack against this doorbell. And again, I didn't know anything advanced. Uh, I didn't know the SSID. I didn't know the MAC address. I just scanned for everything in radio range. I know how these partic this particular device um, you know, will show up in the Bluetooth scan just uh, from, from based on the manufacturer. And so I picked that out of the list and I started sending the packets. Now here, the, the video screen on the right, that's actually um, just, you know, my phone screen overlaid on that. So I'll back up a little. And so the, the video feed is um, streaming over that, right? And so that that's what I'm seeing. Okay, so here I see the, the video feed, see the cars going past. I start my um, attack, and the first thing that I'm going to find is an anomaly. So this means I send a message over Bluetooth Low Energy, you know, some malformed message, and I got a weird response back. So that means I know I found some problem with the implementation of the Bluetooth stack on the other side. And that kind of informs our software. Oh, that's where our problem is. So double down on that. Whatever field you just fuzzed, whatever, go do more of that and see what you can do. Next thing I do is I'm able to actually trigger a crash in the Bluetooth stack. Now, because this is all leveraging shared memory, shared processing, when I crash the Bluetooth stack, that I also crashes the Wi-Fi stack. When I crash the Wi-Fi stack, the video feed goes dead. That's pretty cool. Like to me, like we found that was like, wow, that's awesome. Cause that's like, that's like straight out of Mission Impossible, right? Cause literally you can pull up, you know, in front of the bank, the liquor store, you know, somebody's house, whatever, or, you know, and, and one of the things that makes this interesting is, you know, uh, the kind of line between what's used in industrial and, and enterprise and home settings, those lines are getting pretty blurred, right? This would, like the attack I just demonstrated, would apply to anything that happens to use uh, this chipset. And we found chipsets from at least 10 different manufacturers that have this same kind of vulnerability uh, in them. Again, it will reboot, but this gives me this 
you know, couple of minute window of opportunity where the device basically just goes dead, right? So I can go, you know, now I can walk up and spray paint the lens black or break into the house or whatever, uh, kind of for free, right? And that's, uh, that's really cool. Now, it turns out that um, this particular attack poses a particular challenge because mainly for kind of cost reasons, the system on chip that's used, um, you know, for this you know, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi communication, it's not upgradable. The firmware is read only. So you can't, you know, you can update the firmware on the actual device, like the webcam, you know, device to add functionality or whatever, but you can't push new firmware to the communication chipset. It's read only, it's not flash. So it is now impossible to fix any of these devices in the field. So however many, you know, millions of, you know, webcams, video, doorbells, whatever have been shipped with this chipset in them, they're this way for life, right? You you can't fix them. Now, had either the chipset manufacturer or the video doorbell manufacturer, in this case, done 10 minutes of testing, they could have found this flaw. And, you know, if it was a device manufacturer, reach back to the chipset supplier and said, hey, we found this really easy problem. Here's the packets that you need to trigger the crash. Go fix this before we ship this out to, to customers. But they didn't. They didn't test that. And now that vulnerability is out uh, in the field. And there, there's basically nothing that that, uh, that people can do about it. That's why it's really important to test this stuff. Okay, so here is... Uh, uh, oh, yeah. So here's um, one other quick demo at application level. And then we'll... Uh, uh, we'll bring this home. Here's one, uh, you know, more of a sort of an enterprise or industrial setting where I'm able to um, scan a local network for uh, badge scanners, right? So this is just in a standard commercial industrial, you know, badge scanner uh, door lock. See so the little red light, which means it's locked. So as long as I can get on the network, I don't even need to know the IP address. All I need to know is the management port that um, devices are, you know, this badge scanner company uh, is using. And we found an injection attack, uh, not surprising. So not protocol fuzzing, this is an application layer attack. So I'm able to just basically scan the network, look for anything that responds on port uh, 4070, and which is just the management port they use, pass this injection attack along and, um, when I send the right, you know, kind of string of commands to this device, you'll see the little light turn green. And that means that, hey, I've opened the door lock. Now, that just shows you that in like 10 seconds, as long as I can get a piece of malware uh, on this network, and it's a pretty small one, I can basically unlock any door in the uh, network. I think that's pretty, uh, pretty cool. So um, there are, you know, we're not the only ones who have noticed this. A lot of government agencies uh, around the world have started to promote in the industrial space, uh, things like um, I, the, the IC62443 standard for distributed energy resources like smart grids. There's the IEEE 1547.3-2023 standard and the corresponding UL2941 test. There's the Cyber Trust Mark uh, and the PSTI in the UK for consumer IoT. Uh, so there's uh, for connected cars, there's the UNECE WP29R154 uh, test. So at least government agencies uh, and regulatory bodies have you know, sort of acknowledged this problem and are starting to push standards out now the way different countries deal with it can be different in the US because we're the US. It's a voluntary standard for consumer IoT. This is the cyber trust mark. Uh, I'm actually on the working group that's finalizing that standard. You'll probably start to see compliant devices around the end of this calendar uh, year. And it's, this is going to be administered by the FCC in the U.S. If you want to learn more about that particular standard, again, these uh, slides will be distributed. We actually had a webinar yesterday uh, about that, that, but it's available on demand. So if you want to learn more about consumer IoT testing, uh, and certification in the U.S., you know, you can just um, scan that. Again, there are evolving standards in other areas as well. The smart grid thing, and I won't spend a ton of time on this, but 
power grids are really interesting. They used to be static in one way. You had a big power plant and send power out. But now grids are smart. There's solar panels everywhere and there's cars that they can both be drained on the grid and in emergency situations, maybe even act as batteries and push power back in. That means the grid has to be a lot smarter, has to be interconnected and you've got bi-directional communication going on. That obviously opens up a lot of uh, kind of areas for threat actors. And so in California first in the States and then kind of spreading eastward, we're expecting to see that uh, standard be um, adopted. Okay, uh, hopefully that was useful. I mean, we, um, we have only, uh, you know, scratch the surface on this. Um, you've got, I think with my slides, I'll have my email address. Uh, and so if you've got other questions, I will be, um, and I see that there's some in the chat window, but I will be happy to follow up um, further with anyone else who's, uh, um, who is interested or has uh, questions. Again, just in case I will put my email address in there. All right, so thank you very much. Hopefully this was useful. Uh, Chris, back to you. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, indeed, your slides will be available uh, on the members only platform. Also, uh, the slides from our next presentation will be available on our members only platform as well. If you have any questions for Scott during the Q&A section, please ask them, uh, presumably if you're watching this live, uh, ask them uh, in the Zoom chat facility. Uh... Thank you.